Welcome to this week's episode of Insights. Uh, during this week's show, we're going to cover two topics. One of them is going to be the appointment of the new Armenian president and the process that's going to make him president, uh, which is a vote by the parliament. And the second one is going to be looking at the specific differences in coverage uh, between uh, this year's war in Ukraine and the 2020 uh, Erdogan and Aliyev invasion of Artsakh. Uh, let's start off with uh, who is likely to be the new president, which is Vahakan Khachaturian. He is the current member. Uh, he's, he's actually a member of the, of the cabinet. He's the current minister of technology. And he's been nominated by the civil contract party, which is the dominant party in parliament that is aligned with uh, Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. So uh, given their significant majorities in the parliament, his becoming president is a fait accompli. It's just a process that we need to go through. So what do we know about Mr. Khachaturian? Uh, what I want to do is I want to give a little bit of background to, to let everyone know who he is, where he comes from. As I said, he's the current Minister of Technology and he's considered to be one of the better uh, cabinet ministers uh, in the current government. Uh, he was a former mayor of Yerevan in the 1990s. Uh, he is, he used to be a close ally, and I think he still has a good relationship with the first Armenian president, Levon Der Petrosyan. So, you know, that tells you a little about who he is, where he comes from. Uh, I had said previously that, you know, this might be an opportunity to make a sort of a symbolic breakthrough and maybe have a woman as president or something that would be far more uh, symbolically powerful. Uh, that obviously didn't happen. Uh, you know, he's uh, very much of your uh, normal Armenian political actor in the sense, but in the sense that he is frankly more polished um, and, and was, has been an effective politician for most of his life. Uh, overall, I would say, uh, given the situation of the country, this is actually a very good appointment, uh, considering that you need someone who has a lot of political experience and he is actually a serious political actor who you need, especially in a country that is you know, we go in and out of crises once every couple of months. It's good to have a steady, experienced hand in that position. Now we're going to move on to the second topic of today, which is going to be looking at the very specific ways in which uh, this current war in Ukraine is being covered in distinctly different manner, one can say, than the uh, Aliyev Erdogan invasion of Artsakh in 2020. Now, as we know, Every war is different. Uh, there's no exact similarities between two circumstances. And obviously, the biggest differences are this is a war between two of the biggest states, two of the biggest countries in Europe. And that obviously is going to get a lot more attention uh, for the world, uh, or means more to the world than the Alayev's invasion of Artsakh. The second thing, which I think is, makes this war uniquely different, is the fantastic job that the Ukrainian side uh, has done in uh, telling their story and spinning this war. <clears throat> it's been masterful. It's just to the extent that I, I've come to the conclusion that there's probably, uh, I think, Western handlers that are dealing with this because this is so, uh, you know, cutting edge American public relations or Western public relations. But after sort of talking about the obvious differences, uh, I think there are places where the differences are actually have uh, bad reasons or more sinister reasons. So let's look at some of those examples. It's really emotional for me because I see European people with blue eyes and blonde hair being killed, children being killed every day with Putin's missiles. That was uh, the former uh, deputy justice minister uh, of Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> one can only conclude that if these boys look like these kids, and those three boys being uh, residents of Shushi that were ethnically cleansed out of Shushi during the 2020 war, I would suspect that the, the response of the world would have been quite dramatically different. One thing that I want you to notice in that clip is that the BBC anchor never challenged that statement. Now, let's go back two years. Imagine if any spokesman for the Armenian government had described execution of civilians, the beheadings of soldiers, and other <clears throat> human rights uh, or war crimes that were committed by the Aliyev regime in Artsakh, and had called them uncivilized, I will guarantee you they would have been immediately challenged or accused of Islamophobia or something along those lines. It would not have gone unchallenged as the statement that we just witnessed. Let's move on to the second example. This isn't a place, with all due respect, um, 
you know, like Iraq or Afghanistan that has seen conflict raging for decades. You know, this is a relatively civilized, uh, relatively European, I have to choose those words carefully too, uh, city where you wouldn't expect that or hope that it's going to happen. If only we were blonde and civilized, everything would have been different. What is the point here for us to understand and study? Frankly, we should not be mad at these two individuals. Uh, I mean, they are idiots, but that's besides the point. Uh, what they are is they're actually honest because uh, what they're actually saying is what most of the Western media actually believes. Uh, and we should also be thankful for them for actually letting us know where we actually stand in the eyes of the world. Uh, the truth is there's a triage of people that matter in the world uh, and there's a club and let's just say it plainly, it's a club and we're not in it. In conclusion, what should be our response to this? Should we get mad at the world, you know, blame the world? No, actually that should not be our response. This should actually get us to get to work and do what we need to do. And there's essentially two things. If you want to change the world's attitude towards you, one, uh, you got to get rich you got to build a functional state and you got to tell a much better story about yourself. And when we do that, we can tell all these people to go to hell. So thank you for joining me in this week's episodes of Insights. Mm -hmm.